And could you please state your qualifications as they relate to your participation in today's hearing? Sure, I uh, graduated from Colorado State University with a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, as well as a uh, Master's of Science in Mechanical Engineering. Uh, my master's research was establishing a, a set of tools, diagnostic tools to evaluate pre-combustion chamber retrofits in large bore natural gas engines uh, in efforts to create a tool to improve the emissions out of those uh, pre-chambers. Um, my professional career was spent most of my time in the upstream operator in Canna Oil and Gas, which is now Inventive Incorporated. And I had a series of engineering positions, um, all of them in a facility type role or rotating equipment. I spent most of my time with the Canna as a rotating, rotating equipment engineer, as well as the manager of a rotating equipment team, um, focused on similar to what we're talking about right here, you know, uh, looking at ways to make sure that we're complying with our um, with our emissions criteria on our on our engines, as well as finding solutions to to meet those emission standards. Um, in 2001, I started uh, at Valor EPC, and I wear multiple hats at Valor. But uh, my uh, primary responsibilities is a senior project manager and a rotating equipment engineer. And then in 2018, I uh, received my PE, uh, my professional engineering licensure in the state of Colorado. Thank you. Do Namoga exhibits A3 and 43 reflect your direct and rebuttal technical testimony filed in this matter? Yes, that's correct. Do you have any changes to those exhibits? No. And you adopt them as your direct and rebuttal testimony in this matter? I do. Okay. Um, did you rely on ex Namoga exhibits 4, 6, 8, 9, 31, and 43 as sort of supplements to your primary testimony? I did. Um, and have you prepared a summary of your direct and rebuttal testimony? I have. Okay. And do you have some slides that you'd like to share with the board this morning? I do, and I'll uh, attempt to share them on the platform. Let me make sure that Madam Hearing Officer has enabled you as a presenter first. Okay. That'll be helpful. And Mr. Lazowski, this is the court reporter. I'm going to ask you to slow down speaking a little bit for me. Okay, I will do my best. Just holler if I'm getting a little carried away. I can't holler. They always mute me. So okay. please okay. try. Miss <laughs> uh, Orth. Yes, sir. You did. Okay. Thank you. And then, Justin, can you make that bigger? Yes, sir. How's that? No, we're seeing your presenter view, so. So let me just swap the screen real quick. Wait one moment. Not quite sure. Uh, let's see. What Sometimes you have to go back out and then reshare. How's that? Thank you. We can see your slides now. Uh, Mr. Lasowski, is it safe to say that there were a number of initial issues that were flagged by you and other industry parties with the first proposal from the New Mexico Environment Department? Uh, yes, I, I would say, uh, and that was what my primary testimony was based upon, yes. Okay. And so if we look at your next slide, is that sort of a summary of the number of issues that have been discussed between you and other and both the department's experts and other industry experts? Yes, this is, you know, the key takeaways from all of my testimony, uh, direct and rebuttal, and kind of some, you know, the, the, the highlighted points that are, I would talk about uh, primarily, but a lot of them have been um, resolved in some fashion. And so if the board were to decide to vary from the department's proposal that we presently see, you would think they would want to go back and look at some of this testimony to ensure that they were comfortable with making those changes from the department's position. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. With that, maybe we can dispense with those things that um, have been reached agreement between industry and the department and maybe just focus <clears throat> a little bit on some of the differences between the types of engines and turbines and how that will be relevant for the board's consideration just so they understand how these engines work as they're uh, given a bunch of technical testimony. 
Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So um, I'm going to kind of just touch on a couple of these topics uh, based upon what you uh, mentioned there and um, and try to add some additional information for the board so that as they're getting additional testimony, um, they've got some, some information that helps with context. And I think the most important context uh, and information to provide would be around LEC, NSCR, and SCR technology just to kind of help dispel some, some assumptions that um, might have been made either inadvertently or intentionally um, by various parties involved in this. And the LEC is considered uh, your low emission control technologies, and it's been you know, greatly simplified, and it's much complex than um, other testimony has implied. And in context for what we're talking about, LEC is applicable just to the lean burn engines only, but it's not just a one size fits all category. Um, but rather it's kind of a generic term of equipment that can reduce the engine emissions, um, primarily NOx on these lean burn engines. And it can include a wide range of technologies, including high pressure fuel injection, pre chambers, turbocharger upgrades, uh, piston design, micropilot, cylinder head design, you know, it's, it's, it's a very sweeping category. And the other important thing is not every LEC can apply, be applied to every single engine type. For instance, smaller bore engines, such as the Caterpillar uh, G3500 or the Waukesha L7042 GLs, they don't really have the physical space to have a pre-chamber, which is crucial to get to your ultra low NOx levels. And that's one because of the physical architecture of the engine and space limitations. In the next slide, I've got a little illustration that can help uh, uh, show that a little bit, as well as maintain the proper pre-chamber to cylinder, uh, cylinder clearance volume uh, ratios. And so, and that would be what's needed for a pre-chamber to be effective. Um, so it's, it's, it's a blanket solution. And the other, the other item that's important to, to, to mention is that a lot of existing engines in service already, and Mr. Palmer kind of alluded to this already, have all the LEC that's available to those engines, that vintage of engine, that category, that model, they already have everything that is available to it that's applicable installed. And in many cases, uh, the lowest NOx level they can achieve is two grams uh, per great, two grams NOx per brake horsepower hour. Um, another thing that was mentioned in the m &E testimony that I thought should have additional clarifications is the Horbiger solutions for legacy engines. The Horbiger solution is Cooper Machinery Services uh, product offerings, and it offers a half gram NOx upgrade for some legacy engines. And although it is a you know a good product offering, it's it's actually a range of LEC technologies. It's only applicable to a very small subset of engines. It covers about three percent of the engines um, in service in New Mexico. That, uh, in these categories. Uh, and there's a lot of other legacy engines that it doesn't apply to. And so um, that's the big challenge for low emission combustion technology. It's just not a one size fits all. Um, in terms of rich burn engines, um, it's important the non-selective catalytic reduction and that's it's a passive catalyst for rich burn, rich burn engines only. And the reason why it's effective- Excuse me, Mr. Lazowski. Please slow down and start that last one again. You bet. So uh, non-selective catalytic reduction or NSCR is a passive catalyst system for rich burn engines, rich burn engines only. And the reason why they're effective with rich burns is because rich burns operate right at a perfect air to fuel ratio called stoichiometric and it toggles lean to rich, lean to rich. And it allows your, your catalyst precious metals, can, they can load up with the criteria pollutant and then they can regenerate as they toggle back and forth in a very simplistic uh, description. And perhaps Mr. Lusowski, it'd be helpful for the board to explain what you mean by rich versus lean. Sure, you bet. So um, because it operates right at stoichiometric, it allows where it gets slightly uh, air, excess air, uh, where it goes lean, or it goes fuel rich where it is uh, air, uh, deficient and you're just kind of toggling back and forth 
an analogy would be that's exactly how your automobile works. Um, your automobile is considered a rich burn engine. And so you've got a NSCR catalyst on your car that works in the exact same manner, other than industrial engines are much more difficult to maintain your, your control. And that's because in theory, they never turn off. Um, whereas your automobile, every time it turns off, it resets the sensors and that's what is able to keep your car in compliance. However, in industrial engines, you need these multi-point air fuel ratio controllers. And when I say multi-point so that it can map across a wide range of operating parameters, whether it be fuel conditions, it could be your compressor loading or whatever you're running off that engine. And, and then you also get natural drift in your sensors that need to have a recalibration of some sort. So the NSCR is very is uh, good at achieving very no lo low NOx levels, um, but it is limited to your AFR set points, natural drift, and then also catalyst degradation. And does field gas present somewhat greater challenge than pipeline quality natural gas? It, it, the... most, it most certainly can. And typically those challenges would be mostly associated with um, uh, VOCs and um, on, on a rich burn engine, VOCs and CO. On a lean burn engine, you're trying to control your temperature to reduce your NOx. And so higher fuel BTU can pose some challenges to get those combustion temperatures down for your thermal generated NOx. The last um, kind of item uh, that has had you know, kind of sweeping application is the selective catalytic reduction technology. And those, that's the SCR. And that's where you have, um, you're able to reduce your NOx, which you need a reducing environment, which means you need air deficient environment. So it's a challenge with your lean burn engine. So an SCR is only applicable on a lean burn engine, also a diesel engine, because they're in a similar situation. And what happens is you inject a reagent, as Ms. Keene mentioned, downstream of the engine, upstream of your SCR catalyst. And your reagent, it's, it's a reducing agent is what it's called. It's to create a oxygen deficient environment. And urea is a ammonia, as a ammonia transport mechanism, basically. So you can use urea, aqueous ammonia, uh, you know, chemical ammonia, although there's some challenges uh, chemically with transporting just pure ammonia. But it can be very expensive to install and operate and it's disproportionately expensive for smaller engines because it's a complicated system. It requires on-site power, which is not readily available in many New Mexico operating locations, as well as many locations in uh, a lot of oil fields. And it's very limited if any instances of application in oil and gas gathering operations. The next slide I have has an illustration of the SCR to further um, highlight its complexity. This is just a a graphic off of a catalyst manufacturing website and the, the purpose of it is to to um, show a graphic as to how the SCR works but my intent is to show that it is complicated um, and it's not just something you can slap on an engine and have it magically work. Um, it takes a lot of effort to run these in, um, in, uh, in practice. So a, a short way of putting it is that SCR systems require require care and feeding. Absolutely. Um, and they require babysitting um, like, uh, you know, like uh, the, the diagram may allude to. And I'm not sure if you can make out the, the image on the uh, on the left. That is also in my rebuttal tech testimony. But the, the, the purpose of that image, this little cartoon is just to kind of show your space limitations as to why you can't slap a pre-chamber on any engine. And the left, the left engine is a standard spark ignited engine cutaway. And then the, uh, the right one is your pre-chamber, this, this kind of red, um, this red volume. And really what it is, is you inject a, you know, you have a lean mixture in your cylinder. That's, uh, you know, at the edge of your flammability limits. And then you put a rich, mixture in your pre-chamber and ignite it and it creates a torch uh, that creates a high energy, very high energy ignition system to ignite a very lean mixture. 
And so it's a typically a, a ratio of your about a 1% clearance volume, uh, meaning when your cylinder's all the way up, that volume, free chamber needs to be about 1% of that volume. And you can see that you can't physically just put one in. It's often built into the architecture of the engine. So I think that's that's all I wanted to touch on in terms of LAC and SCR technology, just to kind of help provide some information to the board to just to make it through some of these this testimony. And so the one area I think where your recommendations varied a little bit from the department's accepted uh, limits in the September 16th draft is you had recommended a little bit higher carbon monoxide limits for a number of these engines. Uh, would you like to? Uh, discuss that recommendation and and the reasons why sure so my uh my testimony touched on co not needing to be in this rule because it is not a precursor to the ozone creation and it should be either removed or just near it, the nsps uh, quad j where it's already regulated at two grams per great horsepower hour and one of the reasons is because in combustion co and nox have an inverse relationship when operating in a lean environment, so excess air. And so as your combustion temps lower uh, to decrease your NOx emissions, your CO will go up. Um, it's, it's a function of um, incomplete combustion. And so the reason why, uh, the, the results become this, this kind of twofold thing, one where CO rises sharply. And so you put more dependence on your catalyst to, to reduce it. That's how you reduce your CO. But then also with your decreasing combustion temperatures to achieve these ultra low NOx levels, your catalyst housing temperatures decrease and you get lower catalyst performance depending on where that catalyst is placed. And it may, um, and that's often the challenge with um, lowering your NOx is you get this decreased catalyst effectiveness. However, as, uh, as Ms. Keene mentioned and Mr. Palmer mentioned earlier, CO does have utility as a surrogate for VOC measurement. Uh, Non-methane, non-ethane hydrocarbon uh, can be sometimes challenging to measure. And so uh, I know the agency has, has a provided some allowance, which we're very thankful for, to allow for CO to be used as surrogate, as uh, many testing protocols allow. Um, but even if CO, the, a low level of CO is not in the rule, you create a pseudo limit while you're using CO as a surrogate to meet your VOCs. And so is it, I'm sorry, finish your thought. You're good. And so is it your testimony to the board that if we were to adjust this limit to two grams per brake horsepower hour, that you believe that would still provide good control of VOC while reducing some of the pressure on trying to maintain the NOx limit continuously? That, that's correct. So it helped keep the NOx down where the expectation is without really causing likely an increase on the VOC side. Correct, correct. And if you elected to use CO as a surrogate for your VOC measurements, you'd have to operate that CO lower anyways to create that, uh, that surrogacy, right? So, uh, but what it does is it gives you a little bit of flexibility, whether it be in, in wintertime operation when you can't get your catalyst tops, or if you're having challenges meeting your NOx limits, uh, you can elect to not use your CO as a surrogate and do EPA reference method testing, which uh, is allowed within the rule. Um, and it, it provides you flexibility. Okay. Thank you. Were there any other topics from your direct or rebuttal testimony that you wanted to share with the board or have we reached the end of what you wanted to discuss? We've reached the end of what I'd like to discuss until we get to a sir rebuttal based upon other testimony. Right, and you have comments about the National Park Service proposal, which you're going to hold until we hear what the National Park Service proposal is. That's correct. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Lasowski. Uh, Madam Hearing Officer, he is available for questions from the parties. Sorry, thank you. 
Um, if you would stop sharing your screen briefly, Mr. Lasowski, I'll be able to see if there are questions of you from the other parties. Okay, I don't see other parties or council appearing on screen. I'll turn to the board members for their questions. While I'm doing that, if you're an attendee on this platform and have a question, please reach out through the chat. Uh, Madam Chair. You're unmuted, Madam Chair. Any questions? Yes, Ma uh, Madam Hearing Officer, I don't have any questions. All right, thank you. Vice Chair Trio Davis. Um, yes, thank you. And I apologize. Can you can you pronounce your last name for me again? Lasowski. Les Lasowski. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lasowski. Um uh, I just was um reviewing uh, your uh your presentation here and I thank you for putting this presentation together for us. Um, it helps uh, kind of walk us through and pay pay attention to things on a, a more technical level. Um, so I really have just a general question for you on what uh, uh, what are you recommending? Uh, I see that you're saying that uh, CO should not be included, but what are you uh, recommending as a change to the rule or in your testimony representing the MOGA as a change to the rule? Um, you know, either two approaches with removing CO would be in terms of uh, mirroring the Quad J in SPS at two grams or just striking it from the rule as a limit. Um, and the NMED's uh, rebuttal to that was to, um, you know, allow to use it for a surrogate for VOC measurement. And my argument is that you'll still have to operate your CO as a low level anyways, if you want to use it as a surrogate. And so it's kind of a duplicative uh, target. And so I would like to see it, you know, mirror in SPS. Okay, and just to confirm these, the, those changes were submitted to the NMED? Yeah, in my initial testimony. All right, thank you, sir. I appreciate the information. No problem. Thank you. Member Cates, any questions? Uh, no questions here. Thank you. Thank you. Member Bitzer. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Madam Hearing Officer, thank you for the testimony. I love learning about engines. Uh, I um, am curious. You're saying that uh, the CO, which is carbon monoxide, isn't a, uh, isn't a precursor for ozone. Uh, if I understood that correctly, um, and maybe it's better left as a talisman for other other things that we are trying to to measure and reduce. Um, what happens to it? I know it's it's lethal in high concentrations; it kill you pretty quickly without you even knowing it's coming. But I can't imagine that oh, that two parts is a, is a lot. But but it's it's accumulated in, a, in an area. If there's no wind, what what happens to it once it's out in the uh, out in the open? You know, I'm not sure about the atmospheric influences on CO, um, you know, long term. You know, but generally speaking, you've got, uh, you know, pretty high destruction efficiency that varies over time as you get catalyst degradation, um, that you're able to, you know, reduce it to the, you know, the NSP, NSPS limits on a pretty easy, easy basis with, you know, certain parameters of course, but I'm not sure in, in uh, atmospherically what happens to CO. I can probably find that on the internet, but thank you. You're welcome. All right, thank you. Um, Member Garcia. Member Garcia, I can't hear you. Uh, can you hear me now? Now, yes. Okay, I guess I just need to speak up louder. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Lasowski, it sounds like the department made many of the changes you all suggested. Uh, would you say they made most of the changes you suggested and then you just have a couple small, well, not small to you, but small ones here that you uh, want them to change? 
Yes, you know, I, I uh, the, the department has done a, just an excellent job taking in all this testimony and distilling it down. Um, you know, we haven't come out with a slam dunk, of course. And so there's some, you know, the, the rule still provides quite a bit of challenge for industry to, to meet, but um, it's practical challenge where it's, you know, we can see a line of sight to ways to achieve it. And so um, I think the department's done a great job to kind of balance you know, pushing the industry a little bit and uh, pushing these engines so that we have to think a little bit more. It's certainly not just an easy, oh, we made it through kind of thing. So I'd say that it was a, a, a good example of, of compromising throughout this. Very much, I appreciate that. Thank you, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Member Honker. I uh, just uh, wanted to say thanks, uh, Mr. Wasowski. That was very helpful in terms of how this applies in, in the field and, and, and in the real world. So I, I have no questions. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Mr. Heiser, will there be any follow-up? Uh, Ms. Orth, I think that I would ask just one question, a follow-up from Mr. Wasowski. Uh, Member Bitzer asked you a question about exposure to CO. You do design work with these engines all the time. You don't have any human health reservations about the NSPS two grams per brake horsepower hour in terms of exposure of workers or others at that level, do you? I, I do not, no. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Losowski, for your testimony. We'll excuse you for the moment. Great, thank you. Thank you. Do you, do I understand now we'll be going to IPA and M? Mr. Rose? Um, our witness uh, will re has testimony related to the National Park Service proposal that you're going to hear on Friday, and we're in the process potentially of revising that. So. Um, we may not need to hear from Mr. Blewett at all in response to this, but um, at this point, we'd like to present that testimony at the time that the N National Park Service presents theirs. All right, thank you for that. Uh, I didn't see a witness for Oxy, so I believe we move to GCA. Mr. Boutier? And Madam Hearing Officer, if you're going in the order of the um, spreadsheet, there's, don't forget Kinder Morgan. Yes, I, I haven't forgotten Kinder Morgan. I um, had actually switched to, to going through the service list, but if it makes sense to hear from Kinder Morgan next, um, happy, happy to do it. I know GCA's uh, proposed change was uh, much more um, uh, limited. And Madam Hearing Officer, I was going to suggest the same. I think um, Mr. Boutier may have a shorter presentation, and, and given the time, it might be best for him to present first. Thanks so much, Ms. Gutierrez. Mr. Boutier? Thank you, and all that's fine with, uh, with us. We will go ahead and proceed. Uh, good morning, Madam Hearing Officer, Madam Chair, members of the Environmental Improvement Board, the Gas Compressor Association will briefly present two technical witnesses on the subject of the in, engine emission standards in section 113 B2 and 3 of NMED's proposed rule. Uh, their, their testimony is somewhat overlapping and we propose to then uh, after presenting each of them, make them available as a mini panel, if you will, uh, uh, for questioning by, by other parties. Um, we also have my, my partner, Christina Sheehan, will be presenting two other GCA witnesses on a separate part of the rules. Um, and so we propose to sort of break them up in, into two pieces. Um, uh, if that's acceptable to the hearing officer, that's how we propose to, to proceed. I think that's the most efficient way to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. Uh, for ease of reference uh, for the board, the first witness is Mr. Vic Sheldon. His direct testimony is GCA Exhibit 9. His resume is GCA Exhibit 10. He did not provide advanced rebuttal. The second witness is Mr. John Dutton. 
His direct testimony is GCA Exhibit 12. His resume is GCA Exhibit 13. And his rebuttal testimony is GCA Exhibit 28. Both witnesses will also be making reference to NMED's September 16 draft rule, which is NMED's rebuttal Exhibit 23. All of the exhibits that I've just previewed for you uh, have previously been entered into evidence in this proceeding. So if we could first uh, please ask that Mr. Sheldon be sworn. Mr. Sheldon, if you would join us on screen, please. There we go. Um, Mr. Sheldon, would you spell your name, please? My name is Vic Sheldon, B-I-C-S-H-E-L-D-O-N, Vic Sheldon. All right, would you raise your I'm sorry, raise Mr. your Mr. Sheldon, hand. if you could maybe try to see if you can either speak more loudly or uh, turn up your volume, that would be helpful. Sorry, Madam Hearing Officer. It's okay. Uh, I thought I had uh, worked that ahead of time. Let's see. It is louder when you speak up closer to the microphone like you are now. Uh, is this loud enough at this point or should I uh, make some other adjustments? I can hear you, Cheryl. How how are you doing? How is yeah, this I, now, Cheryl? I think that is going to work. Thank you. Thank you. If you would raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr. Sheldon, would you please introduce yourself? Mr. Sheldon, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Would Madam you hearing officer and members of the board, good morning. My name is Vic Sheldon, and I am currently the general manager of V. Sheldon J. Everett Decisions, LLC. And Mr. Sheldon, please briefly describe your educational and professional qualifications. I earned my BS in mechanical engineering from Purdue University in 1973. I have maintained a registered professional engineer certification in mechanical engineering from the state of Illinois since 1984. I earned an MBA from Indiana Wesleyan University in 1997. The majority of my 37 year career was spent at Caterpillar, where I was dedicated to natural gas engines in a wide variety of roles design, test and performance development, field validation, manufacturing support, product support, education and training, marketing, and managing designers and developers. My role with Caterpillar's oil and gas group focused on large gas compression engine market analysis capture of functional requirements and the development of large development and launch of new products. Part of my gas compression engine market analyses included understanding and tracking national, regional, state, and local emissions requirements. Since retiring from Caterpillar, I have assisted diesel and natural gas engine power systems end users original equipment manufacturers and dealers. I have served as an engine consultant witness to end users, original equipment manufacturers and Caterpillar dealerships. Thank you, Mr. Sheldon. Are, are your direct testimony and resume GCA exhibits nine and 10 respectively? Yes. And you adopt your written direct testimony without change? Yes, I do. Would you please state the general purpose of your testimony and provide a brief summary of it? The general purpose of my direct testimony was to present and help clarify for the board 
and NMED the emissions capabilities of many lean burn combustion natural gas engines of differing sizes commonly employed in the gas compression industry today. My testimony was focused on the proposed emission standards for oxides of nitrogen or NOx that were presented in NMED's May 6 draft rule and specifically the proposed emission standards for new lean burn engines. I sought to clarify why some larger cylinder bore diameter gas compression engines greater than 1000 horsepower could meet the NOx standard in the May 6 proposal, while other new engines could not meet the standard in the proposed rule, despite the application of best available technology for reducing emissions. My testimony stated that technologies identified as low com emissions combustion or LEC technology, retrofits, are already integrated into the designs of both larger and smaller bore engines manufactured by Caterpillar and have been for many years. This enables enhanced ignition of extremely lean air and fuel mixtures in the main combustion chamber due to the use of multiple flame fronts in the design that reduce the duration and temperature for combustion and resulting NOx emissions. All of my more detailed written testimony was offered to help the board and NMED establish appropriate engine categories with em engine emission standard choices that are reasonable, flexible, feasible, and consistent with what is available on the market for companies meeting and seeking to meet the purchase of new engines as well as New Mexico's goals of reducing emissions within the oil and gas sector. For those reasons, I testified that NMED should increase the size cutoff for application of the most stringent emission standards for new lean burn engines from 1,000 horsepower to 1,875 horsepower. My testimony also urged that engines be regulated as new engines based on their dates of manufacture or reconstruction and not the installation or relocation. Thank you, Mr. Sheldon. Sheldon, and since providing your written direct testimony, have you reviewed NMED's September 16 draft of its proposed rule? And does section 113 B2 and 3 sufficiently address the matters you presented? Yes, I have reviewed it and I believe it takes into account the main points from my direct testimony and will help to achieve NMED's emissions reduction goals relating to natural gas compression engines. And does that conclude your presentation in today's hearing, Mr. Sheldon? It does. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Madam Hearing Officer, I request that Mr. Dutton now be sworn. All right, if he would join us on screen. Mr. Dutton, hello. Would you, let's see, let's hear you talk first. Um, can you hear me? Yes, Madam Hearing Officer, I can hear you. All right, your voice is coming through just fine. If you would spell your name, please. Yes, ma'am. My name is John, J-O-H-N, Dutton, D is in Delta, U-T-T-O-N. All right, thank you. If you'd raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth? Yes, ma'am, I do. Thank you. Mr. Dutton, would you please introduce yourself? Good afternoon, Madding Hear Hearing Officer and members of the board. My name is John Dutton. I am currently the president of JW Power Company, who is a member of the Gas Compressor Association. And, and Mr. Dutton, I would ask that you maybe speak a little more slowly for the benefit of the court reporter. Okay. Uh, would you please briefly describe your educational and professional qualifications? 
Sure, I earned a Bachelor of Science degree in mechanical engineering from the University of Oklahoma in 1991. I've spent the last 30 years working in the natural gas compression and midstream pipeline segments of the oil and gas industry. The last 23 of those years has been with the JW family of companies where I have worked in financial analysis, operations, and executive roles. I have also served in the Gas Compressor Association as chairman of the Environmental Committee as well as on its board of directors. Thank you, Mr. Dutton. Are your direct testimony and resume GCA exhibits 12 and 13, respectively? Yes, sir, they are. And did you also provide rebuttal testimony in GCA exhibit 28? I did. Do you adopt your direct and rebuttal testimony without change? Yes, I do. Would you please state the general subject of your testimony? Sure. My testimony, like the testimony of GCA witness Vic Sheldon that you just heard, relates to the proposed regulation of engines and emission standards that will apply to those engines under sections 113, B2, and 3. And what was the general purpose of your direct testimony? The general purpose of my direct testimony was to clarify for the board and for NMED, the capabilities of common engines utilized in the gas compression industry and to pro propose changes to sections 113B that preserve the NMED's central goal of reducing NOx emissions while better accounting for the practical realities involving the availability and use of lean burn engine designs. This clarification was necessary to avoid prohibitive cost burdens on the owners and operators of those engines. Would you please briefly summarize your direct testimony? With regard to the emission standards for new engines, I testified that the proposed standard of 0 0.3 grams of NOx per horsepower hour in the May 6th version of NMED's proposed rule is lower than is currently achievable for some new spark ignition lean burn combustion engines that are sized between 1,000 and 1,875 horsepower. I also testified that it is not economically viable for owners or operators to use SCR, Selective Catalytic Reduction, as post-combustion controls on those engines because you achieve minimal NOx reductions at a very high cost. For those reasons, I testified that the size cutoff for applying the most stringent NOx emission standard of 0.3 grams of NOx per horsepower hour for new engines should be raised from 1,000 horsepower to 1,875 horsepower. Now for existing engines, I testified that the proposed standard of 0.5 grams of NOx per horsepower hour in the May 6th revision of the rule is lower than is currently achievable for many existing lean burn engines that are sized greater than 1,000 horsepower. And that those existing engines are not able to meet this limit despite the use of low emissions combustion or LEC technology to reduce emissions of NOx. And like new engines, the use of post combustion controls like SCR is not an economically viable way to incrementally reduce NOx emissions for anything but the largest engines with specific site advantages, such as electrical power and on site personnel. I also testified that Section 113B originally was proposed by NMED, the emissions limits would have hindered competition from engine manufacturers. This competition is beneficial in driving continuous improvement, including lower emissions. It is my opinion that without healthy competition, LEC technology would have never progressed as much as it has. Last, I testified that an engine should be regulated as either new or existing based on the date of manufacture or reconstruction, and that the relocation of an existing engine, which sometimes occurs based on operational needs, should not artificially convert an existing engine into a new engine for the purposes of the mission requirements of the rule. Thank you, Mr. Dutton. And what was the general purpose of your rebuttal testimony? The main purpose of my rebuttal testimony was similar to the purpose of my direct testimony. I prepared my rebuttal testimony after review of the material that NMED cited in developing the proposed rule. I testified that with regard to existing lean burn engines, those materials demonstrated 
that the original proposed NOx emission standard for engines greater than 1,000 horsepower would not be achievable for many engines. With regard to new lean burn engines, I testified that the original size threshold of 1,000 horsepower for the most stringent NOx emission standard was inconsistent with the Pennsylvania permit program and that there was no technical basis for setting that cutoff at 1,000 horsepower. And have you reviewed NMED's latest September 16 draft of the proposed rule that is NMED rebuttal exhibit 23 and, and do NMED's changes to section 113 B2 and 3 sufficiently address your concerns? I have reviewed the final rule proposal and they essentially do address my concerns. There will be significant challenges to meet the requirements of the rule, particularly for some existing engines. But the engine NOx emission standards in the September 16th draft of the rule is largely technically and economically achievable for the majority of engines operated by GCA's member companies. I feel like NMED did a good job of addressing GCA's concerns while preserving the goal of reducing NOx emissions. And does that conclude your presentation of direct and rebuttal testimony in today's hearing? Yes, sir, it does. Thank you. Now, in the interest of efficiency, do you wish to offer any sir rebuttal in today's hearing? And if so, on what topic? Yes, I would like to offer sir rebuttal testimony to support NMED's decision not to include the National Park Service's requested NOx emission standards for some smaller size categories of engines to the NMED September 16th version of its proposed rule. Please proceed at this time, uh, Mr. Dutton, with that sir rebuttal testimony. The National Park Service offered Pennsylvania permit GP5 as the basis for its proposed emissions limits. However, GP5 differentiates between existing engines permitted prior to 2013, those permitted between 2013 and 2018, and those permitted from 2018 until now. The National Park Service proposal for New Mexico does not make this important distinction. For example, the National Park Service cited GP5 Support of its proposed NOx standards for existing rich burn engines for the size ranges below 1,000 horsepower. But the GP5 levels cited by the National Park Service only apply to those engines permitted after 2013. Existing engines prior to 2013 have emissions levels that are more consistent with the federal limits. The same is true for the Park Service and its proposed NOx standards for smaller sizes of existing lean burn engines. The Park Service is citing GP5 as support for its existing emissions standard proposal, but under GP5, those levels do not apply to all existing engines in those size ranges, only to those lean burn engines permitted after 2013. In addition, the National Park Service's reliance on the Pennsylvania GP5 permit ignores the fact that the Pennsylvania program, unlike the proposed New Mexico program, provides a separate authorization mechanism that can be used to authorize certain engines that cannot meet the emission standards in GP5. Pennsylvania allows some engines, particularly in the upstream space where smaller rich burn engines are more common, to be permitted with higher per horsepower limits, but with a cap on tons per year. The GP5 limits for smaller rich burn engines should not be applied unilaterally as the National Park Service proposed without giving consideration to the other permitting alternatives that are available in Pennsylvania. There would be a number of challenges associated with existing engines meeting the ultra low NOx limits proposed by the National Park Service on a continuous basis. And Mr. Sheldon, aren't many of these smaller rich burn engines already well controlled at the federal level? Yes, they are. So I Did believe- you hear me? So I would like to answer that that question. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I said Mr. Sheldon. Okay. I, I should have said Mr. Dutton. But thank you for for jumping in in response to my question. I, I'll I'll direct it now to to Mr. Dutton. Uh, aren't many of the smaller rich burn engines already well controlled at the federal level? Yes, I believe most of them are based on the the nature of their manufacture date. Uh, based on a review of my company's fleet of small rich burn engines, those that are less than 500 horsepower located in the state of New Mexico, 83% of those engines are subject to NSPS quad J with NOx emissions rates of one gram per horsepower hour. 
Another 4% are subject to NSPS quad J with a two gram per horsepower hour requirement. SPS quad J also includes maintenance requirements similar to those the NMED has proposed. Although my company's fleet is a small sample size, I do believe it is representative of the population as a whole. And it indicates that the mass, the vast majority of small rich burn engines in New Mexico are already well controlled and further regulation with its associated administrative burden is not necessary and will not have a significant impact on the air quality. So, Mr. Dunn, do you agree with NMED's proposal to not impose requirements on small rich burn engines beyond the federal requirements? Yes, for the reasons I just discussed, I agree with NMED's decision not to include the National Park Service's requested changes in the version of the draft rule that it issued on September 6, 2021. Thank you, Mr. Dutton. Madam Hearing Officer, the GCA tenders its witnesses, Vic Sheldon and John Dutton, for cross-examination at this time. Thank you very much, Mr. Boutier. Uh, Council and parties, if you have a question of the GCA panel on this topic, you would please turn on your camera. I'm not seeing anyone. Should I turn to the board for their questions while I'm doing that? If you're an attendee on this platform and would have a question, please reach out through the chat. Madam Chair, do you have questions? Thank you, Madam Hearing Officer. I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Vice Chair Trujillo Davis. Uh, thank you. I, I don't have any questions at this time. All right. Uh, Member Cates. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Member Bitzer. Uh, no questions. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, member Garcia. No questions. Nope. Thank you. All right. And member Honker. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I think it's time to take a lunch break. We need to come back at one for public comment. We do have several public commenters. I'll see you at one.